and then uh, wow, I've never yeah. actually yeah. thought at all. Has that been in front of anyone here? Welcome, welcome team. I'm glad that you're here. So, um, when I'm got the honor and privilege to introduce our guests. Everyone know who I am? So I am excited. We uh, love having guests in. Part of the Rosewood Institute is to bring in uh, multidisciplinary you know, specialists and experts in the field to impart their wisdom on us. So we're very lucky to have Dr. Emma Wood. Um, she is from Baylor University. She's a licensed psychologist and she calls herself a generalist, which is really, you have a breadth of experience in all different types of areas of mental health field in terms of her diversity, so it speaks to a lot to her training, her experience. Let's see, she received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Midwestern University in Downers Grove, Illinois. So are you from Chicago? Uh, that's a long story. No, oh. Not necessarily, but my only education is from the Chicago Okay. Um, Good, great. I love Chicago. And Dr. Wood recommends the importance of holistic individualized treatment and strives to facilitate personal growth through creating a warm and accepting therapeutic space for the clients. She takes a feminist approach, which would be a nice, um, nice place nice to hear that approach today, uh, in terms of her work and feels that empowerment is a catalyst for change in many clients she works with. And that social action can be an essential part of the healing process. Her special clinical interests are in the areas of eating disorders, identity development, diversity, self-esteem, and women's issues. Uh, she's a writer, so she often features, um, is featured in articles addressing mental health concerns in college campuses, as well as issues related to eating disorders and self-esteem. And she's a contributor to WeAreTheRealDeal.com, which is a really cool website. It's a nonprofit organization, um, actually uh, from Normal. If anybody heard of that nonprofit organization, they've put together um, different resources. One particularly related to a DVD they just put out called um, Is Eating Disorders 101. And really kind of looking at where the contributing factors, signs and symptoms, and it's a really cool way they outlined it and put it together. Um, so I highly recommend that you can definitely go on wearetherealdeal.com and look at that video if you're interested. And I think it's really good for patients as well. Uh, she also um, contributes to FEMPOP, uh, APA's division on 35 blog addressing feminist perspectives, and also she presents nationally. And she was just at the New York conference. So without further ado, I introduce Dr. Wood. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for having me, and I'm glad that you all get to enjoy lunch. So just kind of consider me a, a little nuisance. I'll try to make this as enjoyable as possible. I know sometimes uh, having professional development can be a little bit tedious, um, and so I want this to be as fun as possible for you guys. Um, so I'm acutely aware of the fact that I am probably in the company of people that know far more about eating disorders than I do. You guys are on the front lines, you're here on a daily basis working with this population and um, what I've become aware of just over the course of my career is how much you don't learn from books and classes and grades and tests and how much you learn from your patients and really being uh, in the field and doing that clinical work. So um, I will share my perspective and, and hopefully have something new or hopefully remind you of something you guys already know. Um, but just to let you all know, I am a generalist. I was trained in a university counseling center uh, context up in Oneonta, New York which is really the, I thought it was the middle of nowhere, although you guys might have that beat. 4,000 people I hear in Wickenburg, and Oneonta was 14,000. Um, so we were about an hour and a half away from Albany and, and Binghamton. And so I thought, oh, can't wait to get out of here. I want to go back to a suburb where I can drive to three or four different targets within 20 minutes. And then I ended up at Baylor, which is probably the Oneonta of the South. Um, we're a little bit bigger, but we are kind of in the middle of nowhere. It is a college town. We're between Dallas and Austin, and uh, Baylor is the claim to fame for Waco, other than that kind of unfortunate incident with David Koresh a couple years back. So but that was long before I got there. Um, but I do work clinically in the counseling center, and I do psychotherapy with the students. When I was uh, doing my job interview on the phone, they said, hey, and you know, you know, we're hiring somebody to work specifically with eating concerns with our students, so how, how do you approach that? And I was like, no, I did not know that. But of course I didn't say that on the phone, and I kind of 
winged it at that time and made myself an expert as much as I could within the week between my phone interview and my on-site interview. Um, read the book uh, Brief Therapy for Eating Disorders, which uses a solution-focused approach. Um, and went and I got the job. And so for the past two years, I've done a lot of work and becoming knowledgeable as I can about the issues at play with disordered eating, the specific issues related to college counseling centers <coughs> and college campuses, and um, the field in general uh, as much as I can within the context of being a generalist, seeing anybody who comes in the door, but also seeing specifically those students who are identified as having eating concerns. They all come to me and I do an assessment at that time and kind of negotiate with them the level of care that they need and how to get them that care. Um, so I'm going to talk about today some of the things that have helped me with the clinical work that I'm able to do, which is limited in a college counseling center context. As you can imagine, eating disorders, especially when they meet diagnostic criteria, are more severe than what somebody could address in 12 sessions. And that's the limit of the sessions that we have with them in a college counseling center. Um, and so, you know, within that, what, what can I do and how can I be a help to this population? I'll also be um, specifically talking through more about the college counseling or the college context, um, but applying the principles that we'll go over today of feminist therapy. So feminist therapy has been such a wonderful tool for me uh, as a clinician, and just the perspective of feminist therapy has been a wonderful way to feel like there, I can have an impact without having sessions with clients. And that has involved for me doing a lot of outreach, a lot of speaking out, a lot of advocacy, um, and doing a lot of psychoeducation kind of broadly across the campus. And the students and the faculty and the culture as a whole has really embraced that, and it's been something that they've expressed a, a strong need for. Um, so I hope to share that with you all today. So first I want to go over kind of broadly um, feminist approaches to mental health. Does anybody in here identify as a feminist therapist at all? Okay. A little bit? <laughs> I get to kind of share this with people who have not who are not yet converts. Yet, <laughs> yet yeah, will be converts by the end. <laughs> so feminist therapy did evolve out of feminist philosophy. Uh, as well as psychological theory and practice broadly across many different um, orientations, and also political theory. In particular, feminists recognize the impact of society in creating and maintaining the problems and issues brought into therapy. Feminist psychotherapy seeks to understand a client's problem by adopting a socio-cultural perspective, and this involves um, clinically and in your practice as a whole as a clinician, an analysis of social structure, structures affecting mental health. Um, this would include sexism, racism, and other levels of oppression and privilege, as well as eliminating oppressions, both internal and external for all people. <coughs> and feminist therapy and feminist techniques are and can be applied to both men and women. Um, you know, particularly we do look for areas where there's oppression or discrimination, and so we, we often see that um, more often with, with men in terms of maybe sexual orientation or race. Um, but this is a, a perspective that can really contribute to a good foundation for, for all of our clients. So modern feminist theory seeks to empower women and men, ethnic or cultural minorities, oppressed or marginalized populations, and individuals whose voices are often not heard, to recognize, claim, and embrace their individual and collective power. Uh, as a therapist, this has really changed the way that I view my clients and their strengths and um, how to help them be really efficacious in their worlds and how to uh, advocate for them as well. And it has helped me to see beyond just that 45 to 50 minute clinical hour into the rest of their lives. And how do I help to help them help themselves in the rest of that 23 hours of that day? Um, and to work so hard on changing the way they think and then sending them out into a culture that is not gonna support their new healthy way of thinking 
is something that's really a frustration. And so opening this up to, yeah, I'm not just changing this client, we're changing society. And both myself and the client have responsibility in that and power in that. So five goals that have been proposed for feminist therapy are advocacy, balancing independence and interdependence, empowerment, self-nurturance, and valuing diversity. And so you can kind of see with these goals how well this fits into care with eating disorder um, individuals. And you know, we work so much on these different areas, whether it's self-care or whether it's valuing the diversity of our bodies, um, empowering them to change their self-talk, and this is a really wonderful way to facilitate the work that you all do um, to come from a, a feminist perspective, or at least to have that influence you in your work. And adopting this really changes who you are as a therapist. You know, um, for myself, I, I learned a lot about personal and professional development. Personal and professional development. So we talked about that throughout my education, and I was like, I don't really know what that personal development piece really is about. Um, you know, it's, it's a marathon getting through a doctorate, but you know, I don't see how I'm going to be changed by this. And as I've become um, more in line with this identity as a feminist therapist, who I am has really begun to change, and my own body image has really begun to change, and how I interact with my loved ones and my friends has begun to change, as well as my clients. Some of the things that, um, there were the roles that we experience as feminist therapists are ongoing self-examination, sharing power with our clients, which can be really freeing for them and for us, <coughs> uh, giving them a voice, facilitating consciousness raising, building on strengths, and leaving clients the tools to work towards social change. Advocacy is a huge component of uh, feminist theory that I find really unique and enriching to the work. And it involves taking a risk. So, so much of the time, you know, maybe the easiest role to take is that neutral therapist. It's hard to do, and we all train to kind of perfect that. And yet, there's something missing there. And I've found that there's something missing there. And advocacy within the context of feminist therapy has really kind of filled that professional um, need that I've seen in my work. And it's about supporting or recommending a position or course of action. Um, and it takes place through a lot of different actions and strategies and is a tool for raising awareness, challenging cultural messages, and contributing to that empowerment. And so some research was done in the 1970s, late 1970s, that has influenced a lot of work in feminist theory with uh, sexual orientation as well as other areas of diversity. And they looked at these sociocultural uh, interactions where there was a discriminated against marginalized minority person and they were exposed to an open environment which would invite discussion around the issues of gender, race, and diversity that was kind of openly acknowledging them and affirming let's talk about this. There was a hostile <coughs> environment that was both covertly and overtly promoting and tolerating uh, prejudice and discrimination, and also a null environment where there was kind of neither. Um, it was just, we don't endorse this and we don't um, not endorse this. And this was first discussed in the feminist literature and described as an environment lacking either positive or negative indicators regarding diversity. So what they found in these sociocultural experiments was that um, the effects of the null environment had the exact same effects of the hostile environment. And so the takeaway from this is if you are not affirming somebody in their diversity, it will be experienced and perceived as hostile. It will have the same impact as that hostile environment. And so this brings up kind of that case for advocacy and you know, well, you know at what point do I remain neutral with my client? And at what point do I allow them to maybe have an understanding that I don't support um, their diversity. So there are implications for treatment with eating disorders here. Um, specifically, feminist ideology has been shown to reduce vulnerability to body dissatisfaction, negative affect, restrictive and harmful gender role expectations, and eating pathology specifically. So when we think about um, treatment and kind of relapse prevention and recovery, 
know, having the ability to kind of think from a feminist perspective has been shown to reduce some of the relapse um, risk factors that we see. So I want to apply this in a more direct way to the college count or the college environment, um, and hopefully show you some practical ways that we can start kind of rethinking how we think. So just to briefly go over um, kind of what we're seeing in college settings. Uh, for females, lifetime prevalence of anorexia is between 1.4 and 2.0, and bulimia is 1.1 and 4.6 in meta-analyses. Well, in the college setting, it's been shown to be between 4% and 9% prevalence. So that is significantly higher than what we see kind of lifetime, and why is that? What, what are we kind of missing, or what do we need to be looking for or looking at? Um, specifically, we see these sub-threshold disordered eating syndromes or patterns that don't meet specific clinical criteria for anorexia or bulimia. They're kind of in that EDNOS realm, but not to the point where people's lives are significantly impaired and they can't just kind of speak through college. Um, but as much as 67% are engaged in this pretty chronic um, and, and, and difficult um, eating behavior pattern. And it has become extremely normative. You know, on a kind of in an anecdotal way, as I see these students coming in um, for these eating concerns assessments, almost all of them say, I was afraid of the freshman 15, and so I started dieting before I came to college. Or, my roommates, you know, every Friday night we have this <coughs> binge party and then half of us go and we purge and it's just like what we do. And it's become this kind of normative cultural kind of reality and that's really, really frightening. And so um, there needs to be a message of challenging that. So we see, you know, and this may not be shocking, about 80% of college women support really significant body dissatisfaction. 25% of college-age women engage in binge purge as a weight management technique, kind of standard. 40%, uh, up to 40% of female college students have an eating disorder. As we're going into DSM-5 in 2013, and we're looking at binge eating disorder, what we're seeing is that um, that number trumps the other eating disorder types combined. We're seeing this high rate of binge eating disorder. And so this number, 40%, oh, that must be a typo. But when we start to expand our awareness of what an eating disorder looks like, um, and specifically with college, count, or college um, environments being really vulnerable to this, uh, the, that number is not that surprising. 91% of female college, college students have attempted to control their weight through dieting, which we know to be a risk factor for the development of eating disorders. And in one survey of college women, those that dieted, only 44%, or 44% of those were of normal weight. So 44% of those individuals had no health-related reasons to be dieting. And a recent study uh, found that dieting, the dieting behavior of two-thirds of college women was either intense or did put them at risk for the developing an eating disorder. So what you all know, and what I know, is that eating disorders are psychiatric conditions. These are very complex. There is a genetic factor, there is a biology involved, there are predispositions, and culture is just one piece of that. And, you know, you have these um, layering of these issues that you need just that spark to ignite the flame to really develop uh, these conditions. So with the understanding that these are psychiatric conditions, we also see this sub-threshold pattern, which is kind of this culturally induced eating. And it's the pattern of behavioral eating disordered symptoms without those psychological symptoms associated with the clinical eating disorder. So you'll see binging and purging without necessarily the shame, guilt, depression, self-loathing piece that you might see with somebody with bulimia and the other kind of DSM uh, criteria. And what we're seeing with some threshold disordered eating is just kind of general disordered eating. I have no idea what my body wants or what it doesn't want, when to start, when to stop eating, that sort of thing. Um, this intense body dissatisfaction, body image and self-image disturbance, <coughs> chronic and pathological dieting, excessive exercise is a huge thing that we're seeing. Uh, Two-a-day workouts are really, really common. Working out until you throw up, really, really common, <coughs> normative, acceptable. And socially mandated binging behavior, which um, 
I would say occurs more frequently in a college setting than in any sort of other setting just because of the nature of the social uh, get-togethers of binge drinking oftentimes leads to binge eating, especially for women. We're seeing this kind of drunkorexia ph phenomenon where women will restrict throughout the week so that on Friday they can binge on the calories of alcohol then they get so much more affected by the alcohol, then the inhibitions get lowered, and they haven't eaten in four days. So then they binge on food, and then um, that cycle kind of continues, and there's a really dire psychological impact of that. Um, but also, you know, eating your own personal large pizza from Pizza Hut on a Friday, Saturday night, not uncommon. You know, running to Taco Bell and getting six or seven tacos instead of one or two tacos, not uncommon. So there's this kind of socially acceptable, like, hey, we're, we're all binging. Um, so I want to break down some of the <coughs> sociocultural context of, or influences of what we're seeing, specifically related to women in college. And so I don't want um, you all to, to think that I've forgotten about men. I think we see women having nine times the amount of eating disorders as men for our sociocultural reason. So if it's not just to do with the brain, you know, if it was just to do with the brain, I think we'd see more of a balance across genders, and we'd see more of a balance across races. So we keep having these discussions about, oh, well, it's not just affecting um, Caucasian young women anymore. And that is the truth. That surely is the truth. And I think there's a sociocultural reason behind that, just how much we are all um, just saturated in this white Western kind of idea of attractiveness and success <coughs> with your media. Um, but disproportionately so, we need to be looking at why this is impacting women at such a high rate, while also understanding that this also impacts men. So I'm going to talk about objectification and then self-objectification, cultural archetypes that we see um, that are impacting the development of disordered eating, like the ideal woman archetype and the superwoman, uh, the cultural obsession with weight, food, <coughs> and appearance, weight and size stigma, and also the specific risk factors for college settings. So with objectification, this occurs when a wo woman's body is separated <coughs> from her person, from her persona, and is regarded as representing her. This phenomenon that we see that I'll il illustrate in a second creates a cultural norm in which women's worth is based on their bodies, is based on their ability to please others, and is based on their function as objects to be used by others. And so we start seeing images like this um, wonderful PETA ad, and I love animals. I have two dogs, I'm more, all for animals, but PETA is one of the worst offenders in terms of objectifying women's bodies to get their message across. And so you see this, a woman as meat, a woman as less than human. Um, <laughs> I've chosen wow. randomly these images, and you can go and find your own. Just pick up any Cosmo magazine. But women as objects. As a person, she could be there, she could not be there. It doesn't matter. She's there for him. Women as furniture. Really disturbing. Uh, phenomena that once you're aware of it, you're like, oh my gosh, this advertisement for shoes is a woman on all fours with the shoe on her back. Like, whatever happened to the shoe being on the foot? You will see uh, when you start to look for these things, um, these disturbing kind of uh, images. And then this one, um, you know, we see women's bodies cut up all the time. Their abdomens, their thighs, their butts, their breasts. And this one's for, this is a car website, so of course, you know, nice headlamps. But is this Ireland? This is in Ireland, I believe. <coughs> Northern Ireland. But these are really kind of common things that we start seeing, these themes of, oh, I, didn't, I don't know the last time I saw a woman's face in an advertisement, because it really doesn't matter who she is. So when that objectification of women starts to become internalized, this is really troubling, and this is um, something that can lead to a lot of risk factors for uh, eating disorder. So we see this self-objectification um, as the internalization of women seeing themselves as bodies for the pleasures of others. Women internalize an observer's perspective as the primary view of their physical selves. And self-objectification predicts body shame and low body esteem in college women. So these ads are not benign. They may have nothing to do with eating, 
but they end up having something to do with the development of eating disorders. And when we're not aware of this, it becomes a situation with the little frog in the pot of water on the stove. It starts out, it's nice and cool, it's kind of hanging out, and it doesn't realize that the temperature is getting turned up and all of a sudden it's boiled to death. And I feel like we're getting boiled to death with some of these images, not realizing how toxic they are. Women receive the message that they have the ability to control their bodies and that given the right amount of effort, that that control can lead to achieve, achieving an ideal. And that's simply not true. When you start looking at, especially the kind of cutting edge new obesity research, especially by uh, Dr. Rebecca Poole, she's doing a lot of research about stigma and the impact of that and the trauma of being teased and believe her weight um, on individuals and actually their weight gain subsequent to that. But when you look at the right research, um, you start to see that oftentimes people have absolutely no control over their body size and shape. And that you know people can only really reasonably lose up to 10% of their body weight. Um, and you know we know the rates of dieting and kind of this, the poor success of that. But yet there's this message that if you're just good enough, if you're just smart enough and self-controlled enough, your body can look like this ideal body, and it's just not true. In college, women's self-objectification has been linked with appearance anxiety, diminished internal awareness of body states, which becomes a huge issue if we're trying to do intuitive eating. I don't know how I feel. All I know is how others look at me. That's all I know. Increased body shame and body surveillance. So this is becoming more and more the college experience that I see, even with women that aren't identified as having body image concerns. This is the normative. And so um, people will put up these photos on their fridge, either somebody really fat to make them not eat, or somebody that might be more thin inspiration. And you start with this question, am I really actually hungry or just bored? And you're like, OK, this is, this is great. This is like healthy, intuitive eating stuff, right? Well, then it gets to, how will eating affect my spring break thought? That's the objectification piece. It has nothing to do about that person. If it tastes good, then it's probably bad for you. So there we get into that, that good food, bad food, really <coughs> disordered way of thinking about um, food. Is it going to make you go over 1,000 calories a day? OK, we're, we're at an eating disorder level here. You're fat, don't eat. And so this is becoming a normative kind of rhythm of the school year is, you know, I'm going to imitate somebody with anorexia as I'm going up to my spring break experience, and it's not questioned. So talking about some other sociocultural influences, the cultural archetype of the ideal woman is so similar to what we know of as the thin ideal, which is so much a part of our client's world. Um, and so the collective vision societally is that thin equals pretty equals good, and you can reverse that equation and mix everything around, and that equation always stays, stays the same. And just kind of incidentally, women are rewarded or punished daily for being in the right or wrong body um, by the clothes that they can or cannot put on their body, uh, by the comments of others, by the messages they see, by the, the dieting advertisements every five seconds on television. Um, saying, this is what success looks like. This is what you look like. You're not successful. So there is this kind of shaping over time, um, again, with that, that boiling water analogy. And so you can see the objectification coming in here when we cut up parts of a woman to create this ideal woman. The ideal woman that nobody is, not even Angelina Jolie is, because her breasts aren't right or her eyes aren't right. And so we get this amalgamation of things that's no longer a person with beautiful flaws and unique differences and diversity. Um, it's a cut up amalgamation of something that no one can achieve, but everybody believes they should be able to. And that relates to the rest of a woman's body as well, not just her face. So to up the ante, we go to the college ideal woman, which uh, I first started kind of hearing about with my clients, now I don't know why I wasn't, and maybe I was kind of exposed to this up in, at Wheaton College where I did my undergrad, but I wasn't aware of it. Um, at Baylor, I had all, all these clients saying, I'm not the Baylor girl, I'm not the Baylor girl, I'm just the Baylor girl, you know, I'm new to Texas, I don't know, it's desirable down here. 
So as I've come to find out, it's, she's in a sorority, which is kind of the epitome of that social conformity that we see because there are those direct rewards or punishments if you're not conforming to the ideal, and that includes fashion or, or what you look like. But she's bold, <coughs> she's tan, she's athletic, she has Nike shorts and a Michael Kors watch. You know, she's all of these things that every woman, even the girls that kind of look like what I'm being described as the, the Baylor girl, don't feel like they're the Baylor. So it's this idealized vision of um, what the ideal woman should be like and what every woman should be like, and yet, again, it's not really that attainable, and even those that do attain it, so if we're thinking about that number of only 5% of our population can ever achieve the thin ideal as represented in the media genetically, even those 5% that can represent the ideal woman in college don't feel that they're the real, that ideal woman. And so this bringing it that kind of step closer into their backyards makes them that much more vulnerable to, well, I could just achieve it. Because look, the ideal woman's right here. She's not Halle Berry. She's not like some celebrity. She's the girl that sits next to me in class. So I better start restricting my food intake because I, I know I could achieve that. We also see in this setting and in professional settings as well, this superwoman archetype. And so the superwoman is the ideal woman. She's the thin ideal, but she's also smart. She's also successful. She's educated. She's rich. She's uh, in the business world. She has a husband and a child. She's straight, of course. You know, all of these things, all of these high, high expectations to have it all and to excel in a diverse and sometimes conflicting set of roles. And that pressure becomes so very high. So um, when culture equates success and achievement with beauty and thinness, women with high achievement needs, so if you're investing in a college education, you likely have high achievement, achievement needs, may also feel compelled to pursue thinness because those uh, inferences are all tied together, thin and successful. Research shows that adherence to the superwoman ideal in college women has been linked to disordered eating attitudes, which isn't surprising. So we see um, kind of this obsession with weight and body size in the general culture, but this is also something that's particularly heightened on campus. The obsession with food is a widely accepted way to deal with weight and body image issues. And like I said before, these behaviors become really normative with restricting, binging, purging, particularly through excessive exercise, pathological dieting, eating healthy, which we know orthorexia is not an official diagnostic term, but we see that so much, the obsession with healthy food and healthy eating. Um, probably the classic orthorexic diet that I see is steamed vegetables and um, baked chicken breasts with no oil. And the fear of the freshman 15. This obsession has become institutionalized. So we see that kind of at a broader political kind of level with the war on obesity and all of these obesity prevention programs um, that can, are not tested and can be so damaging. Um, but we see this on campus through the school and through their programmings. Um, calorie labeling in the dining hall, labeling foods as good foods or bad foods, don't choose this, choose this. Um, residential, residence hall fitness, which are weight loss competitions, and even to the point so institutionalized that we start to see college scholarships based off of weight loss. Um, and this slide was actually taken from uh, Baylor, this picture, which I had to advocate to have that program that did these caution calorie choices ahead signs removed because you have an eating disorder and you have a good food, bad food dynamic in your mind and then you go and you see a caution sign, that is only going to reinforce that. And it's gone now because of advocacy. So we see then each individual student kind of mirroring this obsession um, with you know, apps are probably one of my number one enemies and I hate that because of technology which can be so good. That's one more step in treatment is to get that behavior changed. Okay, let's delete the apps. Um, let's get those off your phones. But the tracking um, calories, fat talk, oh, I want to found this. Oh, my, 
Ross looks big in these jeans. That's kind of a normative all over the place. Um, social norms internalize stigma over weight and size. Uh, the fact that this generation has always been, this generation being that college age generation, has always been um, the generation that's really, really targeted by the media. So they're the ones that, you know, we're all exposed to it, but the media specifically knows how to target this age group and this people group. And then uh, freshman 15 and other myths that are so prevalent. So another sociocultural influence that we're seeing is um, the impact of the um, of weight stigma and size bias. And this is something that we will be talking about more as we go into uh, the binge eating disorder field as that becomes part of our official diagnostic um, categories. The Binge Eating Disorder Association is a three-year-old association. If you're not familiar with it, I would totally suggest you guys Google, get on there, join. I'm a member and have been at the conferences and they're wonderful. But this spectrum that we're dealing with, it's all the same. And so we have this fear of fat, we have this thin ideal, we have this stigma against um, overweight and obesity, and that pushes all of these <coughs> eating disorders to clinical levels for people with anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. The mechanisms are a little different for binge eating disorder. You'll see somebody who is stigmatized, discriminated against, bullied. Um, they already have this predisposition to binge. They're trying to be in recovery, and yet they get called a fat bitch when they're walking down the street. They go home, they're going to binge. They're going to gain more weight. They're going to get more stigmatized. Uh, someone with anorexia hears that and they say, oh my god, I know I can't be fat, I can't be fat, I'm going to restrict today. So this impacts all of the expressions of eating disorders that we see. And um, the kind of, what we're seeing with the war on obesity and how that's being played out is it's not taking into account the psychological factors that are related to weight and weight gain and weight stigma. And so it's not ultimately being effective. And so we'll, we're not seeing that yet because these have just been put into place recently as policy, but we will continue to see later on um, the types of trauma in our patients that are contributed to when, as a child going through their growth spurt, they've gained some weight and they had this obesity program in their school where it put all of the students' BMIs on the board so that they could see and they were made fun of because their BMI was highest. And now they have anorexia as a 25-year-old. Or now they have binge eating disorder and they're morbidly, morbidly obese. So all of these things play together with eating disorders and what we're going to be seeing and what we do see. So we see um, the effects on binge eating disorder and obesity. Size, size stigma and bias will lead to social withdrawal and isolation which then leads to a psychological vulnerability and negative affect that contributes to overeating and sedentary lifestyle because they don't want to leave their house, that then contributes to the binge eating and obesity, that then goes back to the size stigma, and it's this kind of brutal cycle. We have to, we cannot not address size stigma. We all want to turn our heads the other way because it's this acceptable prejudice. We can't not address this. So this is where you see that advocacy piece coming in again. And discrimination on weight and size is very real. Um, and it's institutionalized and um, organizational. And so we see that people who are obese are less educated, uh, they miss more school, and they have less income than those that are not. And this is not because they're lazy, which would be kind of the general social uh, understanding of it. It's because of this discrimination. In fact, at Lincoln University in 2006, students were prevented from graduating who were obese unless they took this one credit gym class that was instituted as a requirement in their last semester of their senior year, instituted as a requirement. And this was only for students with BMIs over 30, and there was no similar class for somebody who was um, underweight. And so this was accepted and taken up and then was fought against, but can you imagine being in recovery from bulimia as a woman, your BMI is 30 and all of a sudden you can't graduate because of this. You know, How is that going to impact your recovery? This is very disturbing and concerning. And there have been cases of students being asked to leave school due to their weight 
And um, this discrimination only keeps getting worse. Um, and we know it leads to more, more weight gain as well, um, even as people are trying to fight this, the weight gain. But from 1996 to 2006, almost uh, double the amount of reported discrimination. And when we think of populations that are so shamed for their diversity, like somebody of diverse body size who may be obese or large, um, you know, are you going to come forward and report your discrimination? So this number is probably uh, way smaller than the reality. In terms of the college environment, obese students were less likely to get accepted to colleges, and they suffered lower rates of college acceptance um, and admission. Obese students were less likely to finish college, and they were less likely to have attained a college degree compared to their normal weight peers. And why is this? Is this because they're not as smart? No. We need to look at the social context. Social isolation, depression, stigma, bullying. Controlling for income, ethnicity, family size, and number of <coughs> children at the college, overweight females were less likely to receive support from their parents compared to the average age female college student. Um, so they can't afford college. Obese students get lower quality education than their equally qualified average weight peers. So obese high school students were less likely to get into prestigious colleges than normal weight students of equal intelligence with the same applications. So kind of finally, when we're talking about the social cultural context specific to um, colleges, this is really a perfect storm. So we've looked at objectification, and we've looked at self-objectification, and the obsession with weight, and all of that. But we have all of these other factors that have nothing to do with social cultural, as well as those. So we have, if you look at the DSM, when do people start developing the symptoms of almost any mental illness? It's in that young adulthood time, this college age time. So we have age, gender, women are more vulnerable to almost every mental health concern, including disordered eating. This is a major time of life transition. Lifestyles are kind of new and disruptive. There's high stress, perfectionism, a lot of social comparison. Mental health and depression, uh, mental health issues, depression and anxiety, the rates are just increasing. We're considering it in counsel the counseling center world, a mental health crisis. That's how we talk about it. Um, we have a wait list currently at Baylor. I've been full since the second week of school. We lost two psychologists over the summer, so we have five psychologists for 15,000 students. This is, we're in crisis. Um, and then this intense desire to fit in and to do whatever you have to do to be approved of, to get those rewards as opposed to the punishments. So broadly, research in college uh, population shows that eating pathology is linked to social conformity, internalization of cultural ideals, focus on appearance, which is heightened by the dating, parties, social activities, academic concerns, individuation issues, social pressures, and the fact that it is a closed environment that heightens all of these other uh, issues that are linked to eating pathology. So I want to get a little more hopeful at this point um, and kind of show the transition to you know, how we can change how we can change this. And this is that feminist piece of, okay, we're not just doing individual change, we're doing social change. We have to change the culture. We can't just change the individual who is within that culture. Um, and there are a couple different ways that we're, I'm gonna propose doing that. Redefining femininity, advocating, educating, and challenging media messages. So the college is a community. Communities are defined in public health literature as groups of people that share a social identity, common norms, values, goals, and institutions. And the college community has the ability to be malleable, and we have the ability to shape it. And so for me, that's really wonderful news. Um, so what do we do? We re-educate, challenge social norms, advocate, and redefine femininity. So knowledge is power, and becoming more critical consumers of cultural messages about thinness helps to improve body image and buffer from the adverse effects of the thin ideal. Recognizing and challenging pop culture myths about weight, body shape, and health is a good place to start. So we've been doing some of that today. Um, specifically, things like the BMI. Now, 
I know a lot of us use the BMI, the nutritionist I work with uses the BMI, and we need it to kind of, especially at this point, to even understand our diagnostic criteria for disordered eating. But this was never intended to serve that purpose. And when we're developing things as psychologists, we have got to norm it on all different populations. It's developed for the purpose that we're using it. The BMI was developed by a mathematician. It was developed for an insurance company <coughs> to kind of test the average man. It was never meant to test um, obesity or obesity-related concerns. And so we really have to break this idea of the BMI as being an accurate reflector of fatness or of health. And we do that through things like health at every size, understanding obesity, <coughs> fear of fat, or if we're trying to get other people that may not be as knowledgeable in a clinical way, we can do things like this. Is Kobe Bryant overweight? Because the BMI says he is. What about George Clooney? BMI says he is. Brad Pitt, he's overweight. Denzel. And Tom Cruise is obese, <laughs> as part of the BMI. Tom Cruise is a short man. And because this is a formula invented by a mathematician to describe people in the early 19th century, you know, we're missing bone density, we're missing people with diverse heights, we're missing all of these things um, that are not captured in that. Freshman 15, would you be afraid of the freshman 2.5 to 3.5? Probably not, but that's what it is. Meta-analyses have shown that, on average, um, freshmen gain between 2.5 to 3.5 pounds in that freshman year, which to me is emptying my bladder. You know, that's probably going to account for that weight. It's nothing to be afraid of. And less than 10% of all college freshmen actually gained 15 pounds in their freshman year, and 25% lose weight during their freshman year. We have to bust these myths. This is the empirical source that it was first printed in, um, Fighting the Freshman 15 in Seventeen Magazine in 1989. So here we are in 2012 with Freshman 15 quoted in all of these sources that make it feel so real, and it's just a bubble that we need to burst. Re-educating the diet industry, another huge myth. Dieting doesn't work. 95% of diets fail. If you want to gain weight, probably the best way to do that is to go on a diet. You know, people don't know this. People think that, that dieting is a, a surefire thing. And it's being shown to be a predictor drug weight gain can lead to eating disorders. It can lead to binge eating, metabolic problems, weight gain, 95% failure rate. And we have this cultural paradox that we need to educate on that um, without getting too political, but thinking that diet food and junk food, the demand is occurring at the same rate. What is this in a culture of obesity? What does this mean, a fear of obesity? Um, when diet foods fail, there is a rebound effect to junk food, which then leads to yo-yo dieting, which then leads to more diet food, which then leads to more junk food, and their profits go up and up and up and up. You know, American people are being used by the diet industry and the food industry, and so if you use their diet or buy their product, they profit, and that's what this is about. Challenging this idea of the cultural or the ideal woman. So in 1912, Miss Elsie Shields was titled the most nearly perfect specimen of womanhood among all of Cornell's 400 co-eds. Now, Miss Scheel was 24, she, which is old compared to our <laughs> cultural ideal, um, five foot seven inches tall, healthy 171 pounds, and she was pear-shaped, and she was the perfect woman. So this isn't like a hard and fast truth of this is the perfect woman that we have right now. This was what the perfect woman was. She was, I didn't do the math, but she's likely overweight with her BMI. Her favorite food, I didn't put in the slide, but was beef steak. You know, and she was proud that she ate beef steak and that she was a hearty woman. And so this was what was perfect. And so we need to start challenging um, these ideas and breaking the link between the female concept, her appearance, achievement, and success and emphasizing the development of a voice, a presence, and not just a body for women. You can't be what you can't see. And the constant repetition of certain forms, themes, and values 
the constant omission of certain people types, actions, and stories uh, homogenizes cultural views of social reality, and we don't know what's real anymore. So we need to choose really wisely. The magazines that your patients choose to read when they leave here, that's going to impact their recovery <coughs> because that's going to impact the messages that they see about what my body should be and should look like. We have to find positive media, role models, and positive information. These are just some of uh, the ways that we can start having our patients and ourselves saturated in other options. We are the real deal, which is that blog that I contribute to. Misrepresentation, if you haven't seen it, see it. It's a fantastic documentary about how um, young women can engage in feminism in a way that will kind of make them healthier as, as people. Um, different other campaigns. Uh, advocate, individual and social change. Psychoeducation is not enough. We have to build awareness and also have social action. So that paradigm shift from individual treatment only needs to now include more socially oriented, like how am I going to challenge these things? How am I going to talk about these to other people so they don't believe them? Teaching women to speak out and raise awareness while being role models to other women. You decide the messages. You don't just have to passively consume the messages you are given. You are more capable. You are capable of much more than being looked at. Advocating for body diversity, you are the, the body ideal. At some point, I'm a Rubens, so, and 26% of us are Rubens. At some point, I was what was considered the ideal beauty, so I can be the I ideal beauty now if I am aware of that. Um, Advocating for diversity is another important thing because what we've seen, I'll kind of summarize this slide, historically we've seen women of color not being as affected by disordered eating as um, white western majority membership women. And that is changing now and I think that's because of how saturated we are and that message that anybody could do this and you can have plastic surgery and change your features. Um, but traditionally we've seen this buffer because of the non-internalization of these cultural norms. So it's that non-internalization, which is often developed with racial identity development as a way to combat racism. And so that has previously been seen to be something that has buffered that impact and really protected women of color from being as impacted by eating disorders. We also need to redefine femininity. Social action on the part of women to determine their own identities is an important way to challenge patriarchy's message that to strive for the thin ideal is to be empowered. Pointing out the absurdity, like this is a very practical outfit for fighting crime, don't you think? We wouldn't question it if it was Catwoman, right? Like, of course you're supposed to fight crime in a bikini. <laughs> and I shall turn this mop and bucket into a fulfilling career and a bank account so you only need Mary if you really want to. This is the feminist fairy godmother. So you have to point out these absurdities that we see. Also, Brittany Griner is the bomb. She is on our Baylor girls basketball team. They went 40 and 0 last year, which set records. She's a beautiful woman and she challenges our kind of pre-described ways of being a woman. Jennifer Livingston, you guys see her if you haven't, Google it. She had an awesome uh, fight back against a bully on size. Ellen, wonderful example of femininity. Maya Angelou, we need to start broadening what our ideals are, because we are our ideals, because we are real women. These are athletes from the Olympics, so how does um, fit look one way? These are all female athletes, Olympians. So how to become a body image outcast? This is kind of radical. Being feminist in this way, we're asking women to love their bodies. That's very radical in this culture. This was a wonderful um, article in Eating Disorder Recovery Today in 2009 that kind of walked the steps out of how to do this and how to take on this identity to combat disordered eating and eating disorders in our culture. We have to say it out loud. We have to make these statements. We have to get in, in touch with our anger about it. This is really frustrating. We have to feel that and use that as power. <coughs> Don't diet. Become the authority on your own body. Pay attention to the voices in your head. Choose your friends. Set the standards for body talk among your friends. Put your money where your heart is. Become a media activist. Turn your life into a statement and do it for those you love. 
And I find, and this is kind of bringing me to the end of my presentation, but this part is really important. And to me, that's very feminist, is me and others, self and others. And that's that social change. So if I'm not going to do it for me, there are days when I get up and I just like cannot get through my negative thoughts about my body. I don't like what I'm wearing. I can do it for somebody else, uh, a loved one. If you find it hard to heal for yourself, do it for your little sister, friends, mother, or daughter. Eventually, you will grow into doing it for your own well-being. But until then, do it for those you love. So why do we need to be advocates? Why do we need to kind of adopt this feminist way of viewing this issue? Well, well, that was me. I kind of cut myself off. But I have to do it for my little three-year-old self that thought she was fat and ugly and stupid. And she's too important to me, so I have to do it for me. But I also have to do it for my little sister because I'm not going to let her think that she's not beautiful and not wonderful and, and smart and capable. I'm going to do it for my mom because I would hate for her to go into her retirement years with my dad and not just love life and love her body and want to make her body feel good by taking walks and drinking great wine. And I have to do it for my niece, Olivia, because I don't want her to restrict her caloric intake and punish her body. I want her to know how beautiful she is inside out. And I have to do it for my little one. I don't know if it's a girl or not. Um, but either way, I, I really need to do this um, for my baby. So that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> success, achievement, and appearance is that superwoman ideal. Um, this one was a little complicated, but that thin ideal and the war on obesity are related through the fear of gap. Psychoeducation, as we talked about today, is not sufficient. We need to do more than that. Um, we need to do more than just psychoeducation on media literacy and combating negative media messages. Um, the empowerment, balancing independence, interdependence, valuing diversity, developing a voice, is all part of the feminist therapy theory. The mechanism that has traditionally protected women of color against the influence of white Western beauty norms is non-internalization. That hostile environment is the same as the null environment. It creates that same effect psychologically, that's true. And the types of magazines our clients read strongly impact their recovery. BMI, obviously not a reliable um, way to assess somebody's health. And <coughs> self-objectification does predict body shame and low body esteem in women. Yeah? Do you have an opinion on what, um, how, where the medical sort of um, side of things come into play in that. I mean, I just think that's the biggest obstacle mm -hmm. is the medical community. Um, you can work with patients for weeks and weeks and weeks on getting to this place and they'll go to a doctor's appointment and it's all out the window. Oh my goodness, yeah. And it's, um, it's frustrating because they don't have the exposure, they don't understand that, um, yeah, that the issue with BMI mm -hmm. is not a reliable predictor and whatnot, but they're very clinically based, very objectively based, and um, hard to get them to buy into this. A hundred percent, we see that difficulty as mental health professionals to the point where, uh, or allied health professionals, to the point where I had a girl whose BMI was 15.5. She was just operating her regular life. She was a perfectionist, so she didn't have negative consequences of failing. And I brought her in and she was restricting. I said, you are very ill. You need to go get treatment. You need inpatient treatment. Her pulse was like 52. Mm -hmm. um, and I brought her mom up from Austin. And the mom said, let me speak to a real doctor. And I said, I coordinate the eating concerns assessments here. And I've spoken to the 
medical doctor, but I'd like to talk to them. And the medical doctor agreed to weigh them every day. Now, did that client show up for that daily weighing? Was she getting treatment? No, she didn't show up either. And so these are things that we're having to fight, not only with the general public, with our patients, with their parents, but also with medical providers. Um, and I really honestly view it as that. I view it as a fight, so I don't have an answer for you. I just have kind of that encouragement to keep advocating and keep trying to kind of re-educate and get in there and say, okay, I know that this was your experience with the doctor, but this is the way it is. Or going to that doctor and saying, okay, I know that you feel that this person isn't an imminent threat to themselves, but this is what we know to be true about anorexia. This is a progressive psychiatric dis disorder, and unless there's psychiatric intervention, that person's not gonna get better just being weighed every day. My father's a surgeon, and he and my mom came to see me speak at the VITA conference last year, and the keynote was Rebecca Poole, who does all of that um, research on obesity, and she talked about the number one stigma coming from the medical community. So again, you see that tension there, the stigma of obesity in the medical community, and then the kind of lack of information and knowledge about how to treat significant eating disorders. Um, and so that's something that we have to continually, we have more information than them on these issues a lot of the time. And hopefully we get to work with psychiatrists and people that are knowledgeable and trained, but eating disorders in the medical, in medical school occupy maybe like 30 minutes in one class one day. And so we know more. That's a hard power differential to, to struggle with. Like, like the mom said, I'm not a real doctor because I'm not a clinical psychologist. So there's a power differential between myself and a medical doctor, and I feel that very much. So I just have to go in and fight and advocate and share my knowledge and, and skill. So I just encourage you to keep doing that. I know it's so frustrating. There's only one one research article that I know of, and it was written about the, um, the New Year's diet and how one doctor was willing to come out there and say that it's an ill-fated um, problem, you know, mm -hmm. that it, it doesn't work, it's not going to work, and he was willing to put, put a voice out there to say that dieting is, is really not the way to go, and mm -hmm. regardless of what the rest of the medical community is saying, and, and that particular person was criticized brutally for that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just hard, because there's not, I don't think that they get exposed to it, so we can, we can pitch it, but the mm -hmm. likelihood of change is not great. Yeah, and we have, I mean, we have to identify those people that can then also be advocates in the medical community. Right. It sounds like this one guy. Um, but if nobody speaks out about it, then nothing is the right change. Um, I'm a physician, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but, um, I, I would say this, that um, there are articles about mm -hmm. the uh, uh, healthy person whose BMI means nothing. Mm -hmm. But those articles do not get picked up by the media. Mm -hmm. That's not what the first lady talks about. Right. Um, and uh, there's not that much money in it, right? Right. So until uh, there is a little bit more, uh, a more local movement, so people understand that in school or whatever, uh, I don't know why they don't teach what dieting does to your metabolic rate mm -hmm. in school. I know. And as I've done these types of presentations on campus, people are literally hungry for this information. And I hear, I've never been told this, is this the truth? And I'll say, here, let me give you my references, pages and pages of these studies that show people can't lose more than 10% of their body weight. We're wanting these major overhaul transformation makeovers like we see daily in this very constructed media image, but it's not the truth. And so if you have a bunch of people in this room that are going to go out and then share this information with somebody else and then share this information with somebody else, we can't rely on or wait for the media to pick it up. We need grassroots advocates. And I mean, I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful you're a physician. My, my father is a surgeon, and I was um, I kind of not picked up on sharing the rest of that story uh, before. But when he came to the conference, he heard all of this stuff about the stigma in the medical field. And he said, you know, some of my colleagues won't do surgeries on obese patients. And they say, come back to me when you've lost 40 pounds, knowing 
that that patient's not going to come back because they won't be able to lose their 40 pounds. And then it's off their plate and they don't worry about it. Um, you know, when it's big business, like, it's not across the board, but these are things, I mean, I struggled with my weight and I struggled with my fertility and unrelated to my weight, documented ovulation monthly and went in and the doctor said, you need to lose weight because you're not going to ovulate if you're heavy. I said, I'm ovulating. It's not about my weight, physician. It's about this. And so it's very prevalent in, in the field. What we see in all of the obesity <coughs> stigma research is high prevalence of um, negative interactions with, with medical health care providers. Kind of so, just means that you're young. It does. Uh, blame the first thing, it's the weight, because if you were a little bit older, then you'd worry about other age yeah. things. So mm -hmm. just take it as a compliment. <laughs> it works. Dietitians are taught about what dieting does to metabolism. Mm -hmm. There's plenty out there, you know. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's just a huge part of everything. And if we don't have the energy to um, identify when misinformation is being shared and those of us that are educated don't share kind of the opposing knowledge, then it's just going to keep getting accepted without question. So great, thank would, you. would advocacy be a, a one of our dietitians going to the high school and actually <laughs> teaching the fact that um, Dieting will make you fat next time? Yes. Yeah, exactly what we would say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, we're changing the